So this presentation is on module eight in the OLI textbook. It's about finite probability models. It's uh, mostly vocabulary and a little bit of uh, philosophy and, and sort of context, so you'll understand how, the, how we're thinking about probability. Um, materials related to this uh, include uh, the workbook for the class, uh, starting around page 272. Uh, the workbook is mostly a summary of what you'll hear in this presentation. And this presentation is a little bit more detailed than the textbook. And I think the textbook is a good place to start. So currently in the fall of uh, 2020, this is topic two in the workbook. Uh, topic one was counting. Uh, you, you can read, uh, if you're gonna study the counting, it's probably better to do it before this topic, but it's not absolutely necessary. So uh, a person could jump in at this point and it would be okay. Um, but you'd have to go back and pick up the counting uh, ahead of some of the homework problems that come up uh, a little bit later. Okay, so uh, this PowerPoint presentation is available in, uh, in Canvas this uh, semester. Uh, I'm going to kind of go through it uh, here in this video, uh, mostly just to make the uh, closed caption transcript. So here we go with the, the PowerPoint. How do you check whether there's really a 50% probability of getting heads when you flip a coin? You just flip the coin a lot and count. So this involves repeating the experiment. The philosophical problem is, though, if you repeat the experiment exactly, make exactly perfectly the same motion with your hand each time, you're going to get the same result every time. Maybe it'll always come up tails or always come up heads. And you won't get the 50%. So what does it mean to repeat the experiment? So to, keep, to keep from getting the same result every time when you repeat the experiment, you've got to keep some things the same, but not everything. And so it's a little hard to know what it means to repeat the experiment. And in the following slides, we want to kind of address um, what it is that you keep the same or give a name to that. So if the weather cast forecaster says there's a 30% chance of rain, and then you, you go out and uh, you get rained on, does that make the, the weather forecaster wrong? Well, no, you can't tell by just one day, you have to repeat something many times in the future, like flipping the coin. But what is it that you would repeat for the weatherman? You know, what is it that you would hold the same every time? And what is it that would vary from one repetition to the next? And the answer depends on how the forecaster makes the calculation. And a test whether the weatherman was right about the 30%, um, we don't have to know the details of the calculation. We just have to know what the forecaster is taking into account. So maybe the whole forecast, maybe it's just based on the temperature and humidity and nothing else. If that was the case, then to test the prediction, you just repeatedly wait around for a day that has the same temperature and humidity like today, and you see, okay, does it rain the next day? And you just do that over and over again, and if it rains about 30% of the time in the future, then you think maybe the forecaster was correct. And we never really find out. I mean, maybe he says 30%, and you count and you get 31%, and that's a little bit different. Does that make 
the forecaster's model to be wrong? Not necessarily, because the forecast is about what would happen if you could repeat the experiment infinitely many times and you cannot do so, so you never find out for sure whether a model is correct or not. There just comes a point where your data so far is sufficiently different from the prediction that you begin to doubt the model. You think the calculation should be changed or improved. So there comes a point when you reject the model, even though you never know for sure, is it right or is it wrong? Now, a different forecaster might use different inputs. Maybe this other forecaster just uses wind speed and cloud cover. Okay, the first, the first forecaster he was using uh, temperature and humidity. This one's using wind speed and cloud cover. They have different inputs that their model is based on. Anyway, each one puts the numbers into a black box and it. It goes off, it does some calculation, and we don't know how it does it, but it's just based on however the forecaster thinks the weather works. And so this, this new forecaster comes up with a prediction, and to test it, we wait for days with the same wind speed and cloud cover for this guy, and then we see, does it rain the predicted percentage of the time? So an experiment has to be designed to test a model. One repetition of the experiment means holding constant the input parameters to the model, but you let the other conditions vary. Now, does it always even make sense to talk about probability? Like, would it be legitimate to ask for the probability of having a full moon tomorrow? Well, if you know the phase of the moon from today, you could just calculate, figure out what it's going to be tomorrow. There's no probability involved. But if you've been locked up in the library basement for a long time, you don't even know how long you've been down there. And now I ask, OK, what's the probability there will be a full moon when you come out? Uh, then you might say 128 because it's about how long it takes the moon to go around. So, you know, it's not a question about the moon. It's about your state of knowledge. And so maybe, you know, in the 19th century, there was kind of a debate about, well, is the world deterministic or not? Like, if you take Newton's laws of motions and you just do enough calculations and so forth, could you just predict the whole sequence of events? Or, or is there randomness in the way the world works? And it's not really a question that you need to resolve because you can think of probability as a way of dealing with your limited state of knowledge. You're not going to be able to know all the conditions and you're not going to be able to control them. And so you're always just asking, well, if I hold certain things constant and let the rest do what it wants, now what percent of the time will a thing happen? Okay, so in the next few slides, um, we you know, just go through all the vocabulary that was used in the discussion in the previous slides. And, and just, I'm gonna provide a definition for each of the technical terms that was used um, and an example. And we'll just keep using this same example all the way through where you roll a six-sided die and um, talk about the vocabulary words in connection with each with, with that example each time. 
and you'll get some uh, symbols and notation along the way also. So the outcome of an experiment is what you record about what happened in one repetition of the experiment. So for example, you roll the six-sided die once and you <clears throat> see how many dots appeared on top. The outcome uh, E3 would be say, the outcome that three dots appeared on, on the top of the die. Um, so you just you know, we could list all the possible outcomes and make a little symbol for each outcome. Um, an event is a set of outcomes. So the event that you roll an odd number would be the set of outcomes E1, E3, E5. So you say that the event occurred, you say that event O happened if the outcome was, was any of the, I mean, outcomes belonging to the set O. So two events are disjoint if they do not have any outcomes in common. Uh, for example, uh, the event that we roll an odd number on the die and the event that we roll an even number on the die are disjoint events because there's not any outcome that's both odd and even. The intersection of those two sets of outcomes is the empty set. Um, another definition, an elementary event is an event that contains just one outcome. So the event that we roll a three on the die would be the set containing just that one single outcome, E3. Um, it's a little, it's a very minor distinction, but E3 and the set containing E3 are not the same thing. Um, it's like, the way I describe it is like a club. You can imagine you've got, I don't know, the chess club has 10 members. And the club, you know, it's, it's obviously not a person. It's got 10 people in it, and it's got a constitution and a, you know rules of order and all these things. Well, then gradually, one by one, people quit. And so eventually, you're down to the club only has one member. Okay. But the club is not a person. There's one person that belongs to the club, but the club isn't the person. The club does not have a liver and the person does not have a constitution. Um, it's two different things. So E3 and the set containing E3 are two different things. And if you remember our discussion of probability from a few sessions ago, our capital P function, the probability function, you give it an event as input, and it gives you back a number between zero and one. So P as a grammatical kind of a thing, the input to P needs to be an event, a set of outcomes, not just an outcome. The sample space for an experiment is the set of all the outcomes that you want to consider possible. So some books use the letter S for sample space, but I'm going to use U um, because sometimes students will see the S and they'll think it, it's standard deviation. Um, you usually tell from context that that's not what it is, but anyhow, let's just use the U for the universe of all possibilities instead of the S. So the sample space is this list of all the outcomes, E1, E2, E3, E4, E5, E6, for rolling the die, or whatever your experiment is, 
U contains all the possible outcomes. So a probability model is intended to tell you how likely you think an event is. So it's a function where you give it an event and it gives you back a percentage between zero and one. And the goal is to predict something for the future. It's to predict, well, if I repeat the experiment really infinitely many times in the future, how often will the event occur? So like the event might be that you roll an even number. The experiment is just rolling a single six-sided die. And if you say the probability that you get an even number is 50%, you're, you're saying that, okay, 50% of the time in the future, you're, you're expecting to get an even number. So in that example with the dice, the way you're figuring out the probability is you're just counting, well, there's three even numbers and there's six numbers in possible in all, so I'll just divide three divided by six and half the possibilities are even, so I think half the time in the future I'm going to get an even number. So this is an equally likely outcomes model, an ELO model. Um, but that's not the only possible model because maybe you don't think it's a fair die. So as long as your probabilities all add up to 100% for all the elementary events, uh, then you would be okay. Uh, so you could, you could have other models, not just an ELO model. Um, and why do I say model? Well, it's just our guess in a way. It's a hypothesis about what will happen in the future. Um, but we don't really know if it's true, and we'll never really find out because we cannot roll the die infinitely many times. So we just have to talk later about once you have a model and you do some experiments to test your model, how do you decide when is it time to begin to doubt your model? If the experiment and, and the model begin to go their separate ways after many repetitions, um, at some point you want to change your model. Uh, but you never really find out for sure whether the model is correct or not. So repetition of the experiment is doing it over and over again. Like if you roll the die 100 times, you've repeated the experiment 100 times. Now, replication is something different. Two experimenters have replicated each other's results if each one of them independently rolled the die many times. So you roll it 100 times and I roll it 100 times. We've each done many repetitions. And then if we see that we're getting the same percentages, our percent frequencies from the experiment are coming out the same or close to the same, uh, then we have replicated each other's results. So I mentioned for the example of the experiment with the six-sided die that you could make a model in many different ways. You could use the equally likelihood outcomes model, but they don't really have to all be equally likely. So, so you have a lot of freedom in how you make your model, but you can't do just anything because you don't want to make a model that will contradict itself. You don't want where you, where you try to figure out your probabilities in different ways and you come up with two different numbers for the same event. Um, so we've got a list of 
axioms or requirements uh, for a model uh, to prevent it from contradicting itself, to make it self-consistent. And uh, so this is nothing about whether your model is right or not. It's just about whether it even makes sense in the first place. So on the next slide, I've got a list of uh, four requirements um, for such models. And the OLI textbook does not call these Kolmogorov's axioms, um, but these are listed. It has you know, probability rule one, rule two, rule three. Um, so in its list of rules, it eventually gets around to all four of these. Um, but uh, I'm just giving credit to uh, the person who first sort of made axioms for probability. So in order to be self-consistent or valid, a uh, probability model that is a function P uh, needs to satisfy the following four requirements. Uh, if A is any event, any set of outcomes, then the probability of that event has to be a number between zero and one. You can't have less than 0% probability or less more than 100% probability. Axiom two, if U is the sample space, in other words, the list of all the possible outcomes, then the probability that one of those things, at least that one of those things happens, um, is, has to be one or 100%. In other words, when you make your model, you have to list everything that you want to consider as a possibility that could happen. So you're not going to assign any leftover non-zero probability to other things that are not in the list. Axiom three, the probability of the empty event is zero. So in other words, you can't have a 5% probability that the outcome from the experiment is, is like none of the above. Uh, the outcome always has to be one of the items listed in your sample space. And if A and B are any two disjoint events, to events that don't have anything in common, like for rolling the die, um, you could have E could be the event that you roll an even number, and O could be the event that you roll an odd number, and each outcome either is even or odd, but never both. So when you do the experiment, only one of the two things happens. They can't both happen at the same time. So to get the probability of the union of two such events, you just add the two probabilities. So the probability that you get either an even or an odd number would be the probability of even plus the probability of odd. Now, if there was overlap, then you don't simply add this way. You had your even numbers, you roll a two, four, or six, and then you have your small numbers, you roll a one, two, or three. The probability that you get even or small is it's not just adding the two together because you'd end up double counting. What if you roll a two that, counting that twice because it's part of both things. So you only do this addition when the events are disjoint. Okay, but as long as your, your function P satisfies these four requirements, um, then it does not contradict itself. It's a valid model. That doesn't make it right, that just makes it self-consistent find out if it's right, you got to do the experiment many times. And you never really know for sure. Okay.